I mean, that's that's a good place to start. Like, talk about like let's 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 get started, and then as people come in, you know, I just posted it out too again. So talk about like like uh, DIY film labs and and what you've been doing in the class and that class that you started over at the space and, and kind of you know what brought the idea and its inception and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so I, I guess in general, the the genesis of the class was kind of um, based on like my observations of of like a what I was doing in middle school and high school and uh, the kind of classes that I wanted to take at that time, and then also like observing you know other young filmmakers and the things that they were making and the things that you know their their approaches to filmmaking. So I guess it was like the 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 discrepancy between like how I was approaching filmmaking in, in high school and like making videos with my friends and then like how that progressed into to college and learning a bit more about like the between like how process filmmaking and then you know beyond that uh in my professional life kind of like the synthesis of all those things so the class is is kind of like a way to 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 hone a lot of the things that these students are already doing. So it's like a lot of them are already familiar with shooting for the most part. Um, you know, they've shot videos. We're in this world of like prevalent social media. So they're like, you know, they're using TikTok, they're using Instagram, Snapchat, all of that stuff. They're familiar with like the basics of, um, of uh, shooting. So, so the class is all about like honing those things towards like a more, it's like creating the track towards doing it professionally and, and like making bigger ideas and kind of fleshing out ideas. Um, it's very story focused. It's very uh, hands-on focused in terms of like ways to pull off stuff with very limited resources. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, the idea is like just to, to take the things that the students already have at their disposal and like how they can use those tools to the best of their ability. How do you find, I mean, so talk about, talk about like your journey into that. Cause like, I know you started out as like a student at the, the improv and, and, and um, that st class that Mary does and being at the, at the community music space and, and then kind of like your journey into like going out into studying film and being an audio person. Like, so tell a little bit about yourself, Jesse, and, and your story and how that has kind of informed that DIY kind of approach that you're talking about. Yeah. It's interesting. I think that like, uh, Maybe like in the way that it pulls into to improv and like the CMS and everything is just that like emphasis on performance. Like I was always kind of like drawn to performance and, and like comedy and humor and stuff in, in middle school and high school. Um, and that was like, you know, my friends were also interested in those things. Mm -hmm. So um, it kind of like naturally lent itself towards like filmmaking and video creation. Um, and it was also, you know, at that time, I think, like, in my life specifically, was when a lot of technology was really kind of, like, coming out um, and, like, geared towards the youth, too. Like, flip cameras and, like, cell phone video was, like, first starting to become a thing. So um, I think that that kind of, like, lent itself, too, is that a lot of the tools for creating these things were, like, democratized. The fact that iMovie was, like, preloaded onto every... Um, you know, MacBook and, and stuff. So, so the, the tools were all there. Um, and also like, game changer. <laughs> for sure. yeah, definitely. Yeah. Like my, my movie and garage band is probably like really, you know, contributed to a lot of this explosion of creativity um, and like democratic creativity. It, it just like, it puts the tools in the hands of so many people. I agree. Um, but uh, yeah. So, so like, a, that side of things, like the more technical side of things. And then, you know, hanging out with people who are really funny and <laughs> doing, you know, improv and like honing those skills and stuff. It just kind of like, yeah, the, the creativity was like constantly around. So um, yeah. it was fun to kind of like put that to the test and exercise it. And, you know, we made a lot of clunkers and <laughs> embarrassing, <laughs> uh, embarrassing things, but it was always like fun to do. So don't we all um, though? Don't we, yeah, all, exactly. we all, exactly. we all do that. It's like, um, it's one of those things where you just, that's part of the process. I think, I think so anyway. Yeah, def it's 100% like the learning curve is, is you're going to make a, a bunch of, uh, 
a bunch of bad st stuff before you make the good stuff. But well, like, hopefully, making the bad stuff is still fun. It usually, it pretty much always is. Yeah. Um, and that's like it's the same with music. The 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 process with music is pretty much the same. Where like you know you got and if you have like writer's block and stuff, you just have to power through the bad ideas to get to the good stuff. And I think like you know those those ideas sometimes like inform like what you're gonna work on moving forward and and how even if we quote unquote call it bad, but I think like I don't know. There's I I gotta believe that like, you know, something good came out of some of the bad work that, that artists have done. Like, like you're like, it, 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 oh, I'm not gonna throw shade at any specific directors, but. but <laughs> I'm <I> night. <laughs> <laughs> he throws it out, you know? He knows that I'm not a big M. Night shop. <laughs> oh my God, even though he, he did come, he is having a comeback right now. That's know? true, yeah, he, he, he swung it back around. Yeah, that's funny. That's funny. So, like, how is audio, like, you talk about, like, music and kind of the same process of music. How is, I know, like, primarily when you've been working in film, yes, you have the whole visual side of what you know and work on, but I know you do a lot with audio. So, like, how is that informed the way you think about things visually? Yeah, I think, I think uh, college is what really, like, opened that up for me. Um, I mean, I was always doing music and stuff in high school, but um, in terms of, like, film sound and soundtracking and, and, uh, like Foley and stuff. I mean, it was something that I always kind of like had a, a little bit of an interest in and I was always watching like behind the scenes featurettes and stuff on the DVDs that I got. Um, but in school, like, you know, several professors that I had really kind of like showed me how immense and like how much potential the world of film sound has and, mm -hmm. and really how, just how crucial it is to like the experience of watching something. I mean, especially if you think about like the dimensions of what you're experiencing in a film, what you're seeing is just like two dimensions and it's just a narrow field of view of the world. Whereas sound, you're literally portraying 360 degrees, like the entire mm -hmm. environment. Speaking of the environment, <laughs> like a lamp out here. So you knew there was a lamp. Yeah, because you heard me hit it with my hand. So like, yeah, it's so it's so immersive. And like, if you like doing exercises in school, and also like on my own, in terms of, you know, you take a, a video of something and watch that as a memory, it's a little detached. If you take a audio recording of a conversation with a friend or something, and re listen to it, it just puts you right back there. It's really incredible how transportative mm -hmm. audio is. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think that, that that's really where, like, my love of that element of filmmaking kind of came from. Yeah. Um, was, like, experiencing uh, just how, like, transformational it could be. And then a lot of my skills from music kind of transferred into that because it's, it's all in the sound world. I agree. No, I, hear, I, I, think, I think a lot, a lot comes back from, from, uh, from when you're in your process and then, like, you've been working with sound. Hey, Vaughn. What's going on? Um, glad you're joining us. Um, so when you're in your in your process and you're realizing, oh wait, like I I guess I see music. I I, I start writing music. I make music, and then instantly I'm thinking of the visual of like, oh, this is like, or try to create a visual through like the lyrics or like I like hear a sound that I'm like, oh, this sounds like Stranger Things. This feels like, you know, this, this feels like the eighties and like, you know, hair that's like, you know, spiked up and like, you know, like all that, like Mohawks and like, you know, definitely things and like, you know what I mean? Like that's like kind of the, I see it very visually. Um, and mm. I think that a lot happens um, with, with music, with me, and, and that's why it was such a transition into like, into filmmaking. What was like the seminal like work that like was like, or like a work that was like, you know what? I really want to dabble with some film stuff. Oh, interesting. Uh, you know, it's kind of like, it's odd and a little cliche maybe, but uh, watching the behind the scenes featurettes of the Star Wars movies was like <laughs> the first time when I was like, uh, oh, that, like people do this as a job and there's like a ton of people that are working on this project in so many different like capacities and, and like specific fields that I was like, I was fascinated in that. I'm like, I can probably get a job yeah. doing that. There's so many different, yeah, <laughs> different right. things that you can do. So like that, that's what kind of like opened my mind to the idea of like, Oh, filmmaking is a profession. Yeah. Um, 
which you know with like a huge you know banner release like that it is it's like you know hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people working yeah. on those I, i'll tell you i i that was the same I, it's so funny star wars has done more to get people into filmmaking than people want to get yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's it like was, i don't think they're like the, the especially it was like the prequels uh 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 featurettes and stuff so i mean that's i mean they're they're also you know because they're so big budget they have the the resources for those big epk patch, packages and stuff and they can have a lot of behind the scenes which is cool you get to see like mm-hmm. every step of the process so yeah I, I watched empire strikes back i think somewhere around 70 times 70 to 80 times like like oh, that's wow. shit. My, I, it was like on repeat like like cartoons my parents my parents were like, you, you really need to watch something else. And I was like, no, I need to watch Empire Strikes Back. I really <laughs> And they were like, God, Lord, what have we done? Like, Because they got me into Star Wars, right? And yeah. I watched the movie so much, and, and it really made me think about other, other pieces. Obviously, it expanded when I started you know, actually studying it and, and thinking about it and making my own stuff. But it um, to, to other pieces that I really loved. I think like some of the ones that really like marked times in my life, like childhood was like uh, – was was Star Wars and that whole thing and like a lot of the TV shows I loved, and then like I would say like high school was definitely Do the Right Thing, Boys in the Hood. Like those two movies were really like two movies that were like oh wow, because it took it from honestly to be honest as as a young African American kid it took it from oh there's people off in California that make special effects to like right. oh there's people who look like me who grew up in the places I grew up that actually are making these stories that are like mine. Awesome. And I was like, I was able to make that connection of like, okay, not, it's not a far off dream to do that. There's a way to do that. And so my dad was really good at that. at like pointing me in those directions of like, check this out, you know, you could do that. And, and the fact that the first trailer I saw for do the right thing was spike talking about go and support my movie standing out. Like he was a sock vendor. And he was like yeah. selling do the right thing socks and he's a great <laughs> And he was like, because if you guys don't go support my movie, I'm gonna actually be out here selling socks. And I was like, This guy's smart. Oh, I like yeah. this. <laughs> 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 Gotta guilt you into watching it. Yeah. No, yeah, that's like that it's just like a huge testament to how important representation is in yeah. like all media. It's just yeah. like it's insane to think about like how much media in history and like in film history, film history in and of itself is like one of the shortest histories of art yeah. in general because it's such a young art form. So like, um, like let alone film history, just like all of art history, like how much of it has been from like a white Western European yeah. perspective. Yeah. Um, and like expanding that out has just already, I mean, like in the past, like, you know, five, 10 years alone, mm-hmm. you're just seeing like how much of an impact that increased representation is like for all you know, nationalities, sexualities, orientations, like, yeah. I mean, I haven't seen, I, I still, I'm, it's on my agenda, like, this week, most likely it will happen. Uh, I still haven't seen Parasite. I know that, the shame. But, oh, like, shoot. Parasite, like, I mean, like, that's You're amazing. for a that treat. It, yeah, that's amazing that, it, that it's done what it's done. And it's, you know, there was a time where I would tell my friends, oh, yeah, I'm watching this movie, and it had subtitles, and people would be like, oh, I'm going to, I'm like, no, it's really good. You guys should really get into this. You know yeah, I mean? like, 100%. Oh, no, it's really cool. I understand the pe- the way people engage with content is like different and like yeah. you know my parents have said like you know that when they're reading they feel like they can't like watch what's happening yeah. I personally like I, I kind of like absorb them simultaneously I think so it's not as like huge of a issue although you know usually I do kind of like zero in on on the on the text. writing but like yeah I think you, you know it, it at a certain point you're like cutting yourself off to a ton of a uh, a ton of great movies and, and TV and everything. I but mean, like, I, Karis, you know, I was alone, like, that's something that people should experience. Like, 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 Black Samurai. I mean, those, 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 all those movies that are in, like, a lot, I would say all, but there's a lot of uh, really good cinema that isn't in English. <laughs> you yeah, know 100%, I mean? like, yeah. <laughs> you know what you know, I mean? Like, like, early German cinema yeah, yeah. and, like, um, Turkish cinema, there's some really good stuff. Russia, yeah. obviously, like some of the greatest directors ever. Um, Italians, coming out of Russia, Tarkovsky like and oh, um, yeah, Tarkovsky is an interesting. We had to study him in, in world cinema in uh, in college. 
like you know my my professor uh brent he was he was big into like making sure you got to see these pieces and he was so good at finding he he's a curator so he would find 35 millimeter prints of these movies that no that like that we would watch inside like my school had an actual theater that they built for like art house theater that people would right yeah watch. And so he would get the prints, he would get them so he could screen them for uh, people to watch, but then he would show them in our class. So he would like, oh, nice. at evening time, people would be coming in and buying tickets to watch it. But during the daytime, it was like a teaching space. And yeah. we watched these like 35 millimeter prints of like amazing international cinema. And it was like, wow, it's, it's, it changed the way, it expanded your viewpoint of how you could tell a story, you know? Um, Definitely. I think it's interesting to think about like distribution models in that way too, because um, there is so much stuff that only exists in like 35 millimeter prints mm -hmm. and like early works and lost works and things like as media changes, like even stuff that wasn't released on DVD, stuff mm -hmm. that isn't ported to streaming, um, mm -hmm. how much of like film history is kind of like inaccessible mm -hmm. um, because of, of the distribution models. Um, like I, it's super valuable to have stuff like Turner Classic Movies and like um, uh, Criterion Channel and stuff. Like they're always like pulling archival stuff and like doing features and importing new new things from earlier eras. So, and I'm wondering if now with coronavirus, you know, the shortage of of uh, material that's going to be coming up in the next like you know 12 months, if if that'll mean like more retrospective stuff, if Netflix will port more older uh material onto their platform or like what you know yeah I mean, ideally I'm, like that might be one of the good things to come out of this you're seeing some of it but i think that'd be really cool i think it'd be cool if they did that more and and got some stuff that like maybe you'd only see in in uh you know on the bbc or you'd only see in you know russia or or germany or africa or any of these places that you know the west indies there's some good filmmakers coming out of there too like um so yeah. I don't know, man, I think I think um, I think like this. There's, there's a lot of stories to tell, and I think um, uh, I guess transitioning to what you what you just said, how do you think people can approach storytelling in this like social distancing kind of like environment and doing interesting things? I've seen a couple of interesting applications of like video in like this setting where people aren't able to go on sets and they're having to work alone. Like, what do you think? Like, what are some of the ways that you you think people can approach content? Yeah, I think it's interesting how, like, you know, in, in, in the past, like, dec like, two decades, maybe, we've seen, like, this, this growth of, like, the independent YouTube mm -hmm. market, where there's, like, you know, this whole, like, separate ecosystem of, like, YouTubers and, like, people making content on their own and, mm -hmm. like, sketches, and how gracefully that kind of, like, transitions and like there's hardly even like a perceptible difference in a lot of like these youtubers material mm -hmm. whereas you know the more like the larger stuff with infrastructure and like you know bigger crews and and this whole like um process to it it's mm -hmm. it's like a lot more noticeable in terms of like you know the late night shows they're like all on zoom now mm -hmm. snl like being all kind of like zoom based mm -hmm. and a lot of the content becomes like coronavirus focused mm -hmm. whereas i've noticed with like the youtubers that i watch it's like it's it's still some of it is coronavirus content for sure but like it tends to be like um focused on on like other material so i think i think that's like a uh interesting thing to like think about is like how your surroundings are like portrayed and how you're using your surroundings and the things available to you to like tell stories or to tell uh, jokes or to like, you know, create content um, and like using those in creative ways. Um, I think like, like, yeah, there's, there's a lot of like more, I guess, like tangible ways that to, to create content. There's like, you know, Kyle Mooney had this thing on SNL where he was like cloning himself. Uh, so you can play, be portraying multiple characters and using split screens and, and, you know, like camera angles to kind of portray that in a similar way to like Instagram comedians and Twitter comedians and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and then there's also just like, yeah, like documentary, you can use found footage to make stuff. You can, uh, do like more experimental or like light based things. Like mm -hmm. you can be documenting vlogging. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of different things that are kind of like 
unaffected by this essentially well not unaffected but less affected that you can still like engage in yeah i agree i think the vlogging part is really cool i i I honestly think like i mean let's let's pull the curtain back a little bit i mean you've been doing it like you know like a lot of the content that we're putting up at community music space and the things like that you're editing and figuring out ways and creative ways to take like zoom content and putting it up so people can see it i mean a classic example of that one of my favorite things i know it's more geared towards kids and all that but it's i laugh and love it every time comedy chloe like there's like a student <laughs> who's like doing this thing and you're you're taking these like clips of like you know one of the students who's like a co-teacher in a class like doing a comedy sketch for kids and then you're mm-hmm. adding all these different elements that make it like fun and engaging. And like, what has that been like as a filmmaker to take like things that are kind of more in like these, this, these weird, like, it's like, you know, it's like well, now we're communicating almost like how I saw as a kid in the Jetsons where there's like these video screens. Right. Like, yeah. And, we're like, and you're taking these things, and you're <laughs> using them again to make other pieces of content and media. How has that been in process for you and kind of thinking about it and, and, and uh, in a way that kind of communicates what you want? Yeah. Uh, oh man. I think like, um, it's, 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 it's definitely like really fun to do because there's already kind of like a roadmap there. Like Chloe's performances are so like ridiculous and funny. Um, and it helps that, you know, she's obviously like done improv for years and like, it just has like that, that kind of natural personality for like selling it as that character. Um, so yeah, it's fun to just kind of like elevate what she does and kind of like think of, of fun ways to like make the visual kind of more engaging and like, especially for that, since it's targeted towards like a younger audience, I think it helps to have kind of like catchy mm-hmm. elements and stuff that's kind of like funny for for all ages um, mm-hmm. and ridiculous. So yeah, it's it's definitely, it's like a more intensive way of editing because it involves a lot of like little, you know, keyframe animations and things. Um, and lots of like layers of images. Um, I was the victim of one of those keyframes. A couple of them actually. Like I love, I yeah. love, I love, I love the, the, the one we did with Deep Lab and I'm like, oh, this makes me feel like I'm driving down a caddy on, on Wall Street Kingston. And then I see a caddy with like one of my pictures. Like, <laughs> great. I mean, it's like that kind of stuff of like being creative, even in this, moment where we're where we're locked in like kind of like not being able to go and engage or work on a set with someone which you work a lot on sets and you're still finding a way to be creative which is what i love you know so yeah definitely i think like and seeing uh, that'll be an interesting way to see things go too is like if there's more animated things that come out of this or more um like one of my students in the class ezra is doing um a stop motion film so like you know those are things that are all you know intact like you can definitely make stop motion stuff and, and do animated things. And I remember uh, one of the students that's been in a number of the uh, film classes, Max Clark, made this hilarious thing with like Microsoft PowerPoint. Like he was just doing like these like weird doodles and like um, like image cutouts and stuff in PowerPoint. And like, yeah, it's, 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 there's like tons of ways to like tell a story and make jokes that aren't, you know, rooted in directly like narrative filmmaking or anything you can kind of just like use the tools that are at your disposal. So let's talk about that. That those, So let's give some of the people who will listen, look at this probably even a little bit later. Um, we don't have a bunch of people in the, in the chat room. So like, this will be something that people can like reference later on. It, um, it's kind of like, what, so what are some of the ideas that you guys are doing in the DIY labs? Maybe we can give some ideas on top of those. Like you said, animation, stop motion animation, you, there's like, what are some of the other ideas that people are doing in this environment to making film that like they want to show like as an independent, like uh, filmmaker, young filmmaker? Yeah. So, so, um, Noah, one of the students is doing a, uh, 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 like suspense horror movie, mm. which kind of works out because, you know, usually in, in horror movie, which is why a lot of independent filmmakers you see, horror movies coming out of that. And a lot of the shorts that are out there tend to be like horror or suspense mm-hmm. um, is, is that it's easy to do with like a smaller crew and a smaller um, uh, cast, essentially. Like a lot of horror movies are just like one or two or horror shorts are like one or two people, mm-hmm. one person uh, facing up against, you know, some kind of threat. So um, 
and a lot of horror takes place, you know, at home or, or in, you know, darkened areas and things like that. So it's, it's, it's one of those things that's kind of like doable in this climate. Mm -hmm. Um, so he's working on that, which is cool. And like thinking about light and thinking about like building suspense and building dread. Um, Max's idea, which has since been abandoned, but, uh, it was initially, um, like this guy who is tracking down this cloning device. And like, there's a bunch of clones of himself that he has to fight through to get to it. <laughs> so like, yeah, the duplication, uh, yeah thing works really well although usually with something like that you need like stand-ins too but you know you can always have like a family member yeah especially a brother shelter do that a bunch of people yeah exactly yeah. yeah so um so yeah it's there's like a ton of different ways to do it when you look at like um some of the other like content creators too like uh yeah playing multiple characters mm -hmm. uh at the same time and like having some kind of costume change to like indicate that mm -hmm. um works yeah, there's like there's a bunch of different ways that you can approach it. I like that. I like those ideas. I also I am um, I watched Parks and Rec like last night. Their their uh, their comeback episode. They were going to do one episode to raise money for frontline workers and, and causes, and they did this thing where it was like all they were all obviously when they ended their season they all were living in different places. So mm. they did this thing where they have like a phone tree where like they're all like like you know leslie nope is if you watch that show she's like super mm -hmm. like focused on staying connected with her friends so she's like started this phone tree and they did like each person needed to call the next person and then some people didn't want to call that person, and they made it like kind of like that and then threw in the then threw in like uh commercials of other people other characters or news specials for the people who were like local newscasters on the show at oh time. nice <laughs> and it was really inventive i thought it was like man that's a great episode for like needing and the stuff saturday night live has been doing to, for not having like a crew around you and just trying to figure out a concept that works in this environment i thought that was really well done as well on like a more light comedy kind of thing like a phone tree concept is one thing definitely um, yeah I mean, like, Zoom-focused stuff, like, yeah, there's there's definitely a lot, like, cropping up now. And, like, it's interesting because there's this show, I forget, oh, man, what is it called? It's the the Phoebe from uh, Friends. Mm. What's her name? Lisa Kudrow. Lisa Kudrow, yeah. Made yeah. this show about, like, a, a psychiatrist, um, like, a couple of years ago. It was, like, a web show. And I think it was during, like, a writer's strike. Um, but that was, like, pretty much you see the entire series through video chat. So just to think about how like that format now is like so prevalent out of necessity, yeah. um, you know, from, from a lot of these shows and it's cool seeing like how people are getting creative with it. I saw an advertisement for like a sitcom that's going to do an entire series via zoom. So they like, got, they got no choice. They, they, I mean, like we're all in this, in this place. And I think, you know, it, it that's why I'm, that's why I think this is such a, a good thing to kind of talk about is like, Hey, when we're talking about, you know, some of the things you can do in this moment as a filmmaker, you know, that to actually make stuff. I think um, it's important to kind of think about, okay, what, what can I do by myself in film? Uh, well, one thing I think that th people can always do, which I think they'll get in the class is there's a language in cinema that, you know, in this fast paced YouTube, which I don't, I love it. Cause it's like, like you said, distribution models are changing and it's making people able to get into they're uh, into making stuff a lot easier, but there's a language in cinema that I think people can spend time learning and investigating, um, like while you're in this space, like, you know, some of the Criterion stuff, look up a person like Stan Brackage, who to me is like, does, does a lot of alone experimental stuff in like the 60s and the 70s that like would be definitely interesting to watch. Um, find like, you know, find like, you know, the, I, like something you did with your class of like, frame like let's talk about composition like what is this 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 like kind of composition communicate if you need to bone up on some of those those kind of things in the language or what's what kind of frame rate communicate like is going to help me to shoot at if i want to do this so if i so if you want to shoot slow-mo knowing that you need to crank up versus like crank down you know there's things that like people can spend time learning about the technical and the language of cinema and, and what's mise-en-scene. How do you do, how do you like make a scene look a certain way that I think it help even in this isolation. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's a great time to brush up on and dig into like, uh, 
like film theory for creators and, and people working in film like it's it's a super great time to like dig into that and dig into film history and dig into film theory and and kind of watch things critically um yeah most of the directors that i follow on like twitter or instagram and stuff are, are watching things and my friends that you know are, are stuck at home now are watching a lot in isolation so it's definitely a good time to kind of like take it as an opportunity as like a sabbatical or like you know you're like digging into uh watching stuff with a critical eye. Um, I've been like giving some, some feedback on like some friends projects too. So like um, it's a great time for writers. Like I've seen my, my cousin recently wrote an entire feature script, uh, which like, you know, I, I, I don't think that people should feel like pressure to like, I got to write a feature right now. Yeah. Well, like, you know, like <laughs> if it strikes you, if you, out. if you have the time each day, yeah. It's like, you're being lazy. You're not writing that feature. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but like, you know, it's finding the time to write a little bit each day, scripting things out, uh, storyboards you can do in isolation. Like, you can be planning the thing you're going to shoot uh, when this all, you know, goes out of lockdown now, um, which is cool. And then, yeah, like working on, on small exercises and like figuring out how you can like push yourself um, to to use different techniques and to kind of like explore different facets of film history. And sure. yeah. There's, there's a lot of ways you can, like, stay in touch with it. Yeah, stay in touch with the filmmaking process. And I, and I, I, I think, like, you know, self, self-portraits. self I think diarying, that video diaries or video vlogs kind of thing yeah. during this time period are critical because, like, I, you know, documenting what's happening right now while we're going through this in things that may live on for a long time for people. Yeah who were born later or never experienced this to actually see what this was like, you know, is, is valuable. There's value in that, I think, you know? So it's like a, it's a, you know, they end up being kind of historical documents. It's like a, a, a primary document, right? Yep. Um, that's like, yeah. One, one of uh, my friends from college, Jackson was shooting a, like he's in New York. He's a DP based in, um, in uh, New York city. Mm-hmm. And um, he was he was going out and shooting a lot of stuff with like the the you know streets being abandoned. I believe it was for like an advertisement campaign or something, or maybe it was for the city. Yeah. Um, but themselves, but but yeah, shooting a lot of like you know the streets being empty and like just the like really bizarre state that everything's in now. Which like yeah, eventually that'll like hold up, be good for like documentary footage, be good for you know reference to like oh this is what it looked like. All um, that drone footage. I've seen so much drone footage. I've seen like you know New York City. I've seen Austin. I've seen like L.A. It's like it's wild. People are like really getting out there with their with their you know like aerial footage and showing some of what, how empty everything is and how quickly you can get get through spaces and and um, and I mean and some people you know and, and like you know this is a, a like you said a historical document that's going to show the moment we're in, how we're navigating it, and and. I mean, this is where film, I, my personal belief about film and cinema, this is where it really has power, right? To like take these things and show what's happening in a moment that, that you can't capture any other time. Like not just like, hey, I'm going to set this whole shot up and make it look this way. Yeah, that's cool. But also like that documenting, like documentary style, like, hey, this actually is happening and this is what it looks like and this is what it feels like. And, um, and using cinema as a language to communicate emotion um and and moments is is i think really powerful you know so yeah definitely and it's something that's like more more available than ever to everyone you know like everyone's like instagram stories or everyone's uh snapchat uh stories and stuff are are all you know a part of like what it's like right now to 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 be living through this so i agree i mean i think live think about like the democratized uh uh documentation I love it. I love that. I love, I love it. I love, I mean, a lot of times, you know, to, to a lot of times people are down on like how, how much, you know, here's everybody, you know, you can just pick up a phone and shoot a film. And, but to me, you know, to be completely honest, it, it gives the reason I think the people were down on it is exactly what you were talking about is that it's been a closed system for so long. I mean, when I was going through college, I got a, I got a, 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 failing grade because I, I refused to write a paper uh, that was in support of, of um, 
God, that movie that I hate with uh, you know, I put I almost block it out of my mind right now. It was uh it was it was it's um the very first the the very first movie that everybody talks about was like this great movie with sound. Oh, was it Birth uh, of a Nation? Birth of a Nation. Oh God. <laughs> I like refused the KKK heroics movie. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So I was like I was like, I'm not gonna talk glowingly about this piece that is everything I despise, right? And yeah. And my teacher at that moment, you're still in this good old boys kind of network where it's like there were I mean, like literally when I was going to school, it was two thousand and four I graduated from college and, and film, it was there was like, you know, this whole thing about push to let's get more women directing. It's like, I mean, they're still doing that. Like 20 years later, we're still, I mean, there's and it's still, yeah, right. It's still, still so happening. imbalanced. Because yeah. It's so imbalanced. And so there's mm -hmm. like, you know, there's definitely like this closed system. So the advent of like camera phones and, and these like affordable ways to like grab, like, you know, uh, high definition footage and 4k footage and 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 tell your story in digital video is is so so key man like and, and i and i know that mm -hmm. that's why i think people are, are so like down oh here's everybody everybody can do it it's not the same i mean i get it some people it's your profession and you're whatever but as musicians i kind of just that happened to us years ago get over it and make something cool and like figure out how to adapt right to it. you know what i mean yeah and and just because uh uh you know, someone shoots so just because Sean Baker is shooting features on an iPhone doesn't mean that Paul Thomas Anderson isn't still shooting on like 70 millimeter and, you know, like th they all exist simultaneously. It's not like, you know, the, the iPhones are taking over and making <laughs> everything else like disappear. Yeah, so, 100%. yeah, I think like, and when it comes to filmmaking, like story is like the heart of everything. Like you can shoot something on a Nokia <laughs> like, and if the story's good and you can tell what people are saying, uh, then you'll be invested, you know, like Blair Witch is like low, you know, low quality, right. you know, DV tape, I believe. Right. It's like, it's like, you know, yeah, it's it like, like so, and in GL2, I think, or something like that. Yeah. XL, XL, yeah it was and it's an incredible horror movie. So yeah. like, you know, it's, uh, the tools at your disposal can like, yeah, can elevate it and like don't even necessarily, like like story is really the, the most important thing if you're really paying attention to story and like how you're building it visually and uh, portraying everything, then like that's gonna really like carry it. And like, yeah, attention to sound design, attention to, to uh, how things are revealed, mm -hmm. um, how, you know, how uh, the depth of your characters mm -hmm. is operating, like, yeah, that's all gonna go like spades ahead for like viewership than than something looking pretty. I agree, I hundred percent agree, and I also think I also think that the effects that this kind of well, I've been watching the news and everybody's on a Zoom video like working from home as they're like putting it on CNN or MSNBC or you know even like Saturday Night Live doing it the way they were doing it. What that's doing is the same thing that happened with digital video. It's, it's normalizing the hand to face, the, the, the visual kind of, kind of feeling of these, like what we're doing right now. Yeah. It's starting to become more normal where the person who's viewing it won't feel like, oh, that's cheesy or that's low rent or that doesn't look great. Or I don't love, I don't love the way that looks they'll start to feel like, oh yeah, that's just somebody doing that kind of session. And then the content will matter more, even more than how it looks because of that, because they're normalizing some of the production limitations in a way that make it like more about what you're saying and what you're showing. You know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. So. No, I hear what you're saying in terms of like, like I guess it, you know, it's similar to, to representation that way. It's like you're seeing something that's like from your day-to-day -day life that is then like reflected in the content that you're, you're, uh you know taking in so mm -hmm. it be, it creates this like direct link, linkage and like kind of changes the landscape 100 percent. yeah what so what so so what it so let's like for the people who are newer to this process so walk through like the three like the kind of stages of like 
what you do in the class. I know there's like three stages pretty much of pre, like it's pre-production, production, post-production, post right? And then right. I, there's like the distribution piece and I, but we'll just include that in post-production. Why don't you walk some people through kind of like the stages of how you approach that if from a DIY standpoint when you guys are getting in the class. Like we know like the big production, there's lots of writers and then you get location scouting and you can talk to someone like I know you do some of that with location mm -hmm. scouting and things of that nature, but but I just want to kind of get a sense of like how you walk through those three stages of production for, for like DIY. Yeah. So I have it, I try and have it kind of reflect, uh, you know, the, the professional stages in a way, but still being like engaging and fun for the students mm -hmm. um, in the sense that pre-production is like the, the, the biggest focus um, because like the more that the students are really, cause that, I think that's really like what, ends up setting apart the things that they're doing in the class versus like something that they just go and like shoot on a whim mm -hmm. um, is like really kind of digging into like, like beyond just like having the idea and then going and shooting it, like having the idea and, and sitting with it for a while and working on it and thinking about how am I going to shoot this? How am I going to tell this? How am I going to change this um, heading into to actually shooting it? And then while we're working on pre-production stuff, we're screenwriting, we're uh, doing treatments, we're uh, making storyboards, making shot lists. While we're doing that, I try and kind of like put in some, some smaller exercises so that the students are learning about framing, mm. they're learning about, uh, you know, cinematic language, they're learning about different ways that they can kind of like pull off shots, learning about, you know, uh, DIY dolly techniques and, and uh, like DIY camera movements. Um, give me one. Give me one of DIY dolly techniques. Oh shoot! So I was just talking with Noah about one of these. Is is um like for for dollies, the the like classic uh, cheap move is just using cardboard or like a sled or something. You yeah. can just put the tripod on a uh, on a piece of cardboard, or if you're using like a surface or a table or something, you can literally just put a cardboard box mm -hmm. on the uh, <laughs> on the surface, and then you put the camera right on there fix it down and use it as like a slider essentially. What? So it's just a, a way to like get some movement That's in your crazy. shots. You're saying you're putting the camera on the cardboard on a flat surface and then, and then sliding the camera it. across. Oh, sliding the cardboard. Yeah, you slide the cardboard. Wow. Yeah. 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 yeah wow, that's a, that is really cool. It's that smooth <laughs> movement. Yeah. <laughs> putting like tennis balls on the bottom of the tripod to like remove yeah. the stick too. If you have like a hardwood floor. Yeah. A lot of people use wheelchairs. If you have a wheelchair around or like a rolling yeah, chair. chair. Yeah, people actually actually use those on, on, uh, on sets I've been on. Like, yeah. You're like dolly kind of thing, you know, so. I know that, uh, 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 oh, God, who is it that's used those a ton? Um, God, the Death Proof guy. I'm completely blanking on his name right now. I blanked on Birth of a Nation, so come on, like it's fine. I blank, which is probably yeah. a good. Oh thing. God, I mean, probably okay to blank yeah, on Birth okay of a Nation. I blanked on that one. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to actually kind of revisit that because, like, it's it's super telling that like one of the first movies and like probably like the the movie that like established cinematic conventions in the United States and kind of like the world over. Like that movie really like established like. Uh, Nonlinear storytelling, or not even nonlinear storytelling, but like um, you know, cutaways, like having having action happen simultaneously in different locations um, mm -hmm. as a way of like putting together story. There's just so much stuff that that movie established, and it's like this super racist, terrible, uh, like horrible, yeah, like white supremacy narrative. It's like it's it's it is. It's like telling it. It just goes to show how much like the art forms in our country and like kind of the world over kind of like get. Entrenched hijacked by yeah. Uh, those uh, yeah i agree and there was an agenda there that was also perpetrated in the media like while this the technological things are what they are the the actual like you said you could do all this you can do all of the all of the technical things right and get all things to look a certain way but it comes down to story and i think like for me when i was thinking about it and looking at that from that lens as a student and a person who came to cinema as like i love star wars i love do the right thing i i instantly like had a i had a visceral response to that film of like you know what this is ridiculous. This is super, I mean, problematic in the language and the lexicon wasn't even a thing at that point, but I knew it was problematic and I knew, oh, yeah. <laughs> and I knew also that it was, it was 
that how powerful media is. I truly believe why I say the things about like media is that, that the visual medium has such strength in, why, in being able to communicate ideas about things that we've never experienced. We've never gone to this place or we've never lived in this situation. So we take that and a lot of times what will happen is people will ingest the media and be like, oh, well now I've, I have some idea of what it's like to be this thing. So to see like, you know, uh, to see a film that 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 heralded and championed white supremacy on that level was was off putting and 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 it made me angry. So I wrote yeah. I wrote, I wrote my paper based on that. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, and it's not it's not like in a critical way. It's in a way that's like you know propagandizing and kind it's of propaganda. Like exactly. Yeah. It's seriously propaganda that like people can yeah. take and be like, oh, this is the reason why we should act the way we act. And it was. Bro, I, I literally, and the, the crazy part to me, why I brought it up of how entrenched that mindset has been inside cinema and why it's good that we're in a moment where there is more representation and where ideas are being being pushed to the forefront, which a lot of people won't give certain, but there's a lot of filmmakers who really took the brunt of pushback to make that a reality today. The people who are sometimes looked at as like, I, I think... Spike doesn't get enough credit for that. He took a lot Definitely. of hits early on that that other people are benefiting for that from now. But he definitely took those punches like early to like say, "Nah, this is not cool." And um, and I and I think you know Oscar Micheaux is another person that nobody took. Like people always act like Spike was the first like black director, which he is a very important black director, but. For me, my dad mm-hmm. and me sitting down and watching some Oscar Micheaux movies of what he was doing in early, like not no like sound before sound, like silent movies into sound. He was making some powerful pieces of art, and that's not that's not put in the curriculum of film schools. And so we get Birth of a Nation, and that's what I wrote. I wrote that paper, and I failed. That shows you how entrenched it was. I literally got a D on that paper because I refused to. Oh God! Yeah, I literally got a D, and I and I said, "Listen, I was going to A in the class if writing that paper and sticking to my guns got me a D, and then I ended up with a B in the class. At least I could hold my head up, knowing that I didn't like just like." you know take take that yeah that's all you know what i mean i was like fine cool. just like not not support something that's like you know in line with your values 100 percent. yeah no it's it's super like it's super interesting to kind of dig into like the history of of uh yeah like black filmmakers in the united states and 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 you know how they kind of i just was watching you know some sydney uh Poirier. Mm-hmm movies and like you know how he kind of like leveraged black exploitation the black exploitation era to kind of like tell these stories in a very interesting way Mm -hmm. um that's like kind of portraying like the different facets of like black life in the 70s in the united states and like those communities and like celebrating those communities um and then like experimental filmmakers like bill greaves Mm -hmm. and stuff that like were just doing like completely out of the box like really interesting like meta textual kind of stuff like Symbiopsychotaxoplasm is one of my favorite experimental films because it's just so like, it's just such a bizarre setup. And like, he's like playing this character that's like an exaggerated version of himself and like messing with his crew. And it's just, it's like, yeah, there's, there's, there's all of these different like filmmakers that you can kind of like dig into and like see like, wow, if, if, if these were the voices that had shaped commercial filmmaking in the same way that, you know, D.W. Griffith did, or like in you know if they were in that position instead of him like what would filmmaking look like today well it's it just like it a really just, interesting and you know filmmaking like any art form like there's always an argument does like how does art imitate life or does life imitate art and people talk about that and the reality of it is, is that that wasn't in that moment when he's making that film in my opinion there already were some social issues that needed to be addressed as we all know that Definitely. were not <laughs> Right, that's so like, like so, so, <laughs> so that's an understatement of the, of, yeah. of, of the thing, right? So, like, with that being said, like he was, he was like clearly on the side of oppression, like clearly on the side of that, and mm-hmm. and they were, and I think due to that, you know, I, I think like, but that's the story of of where we, I think like that's the power in right. the stories, and that's the story of what we've lived That's through. the historic, that's the history of the U.S. That's like, you know, it doesn't shy away from it. Exactly. So I think, I think like, like more women directors, more multicultural directors, more, yeah. and, and not only directors, let's keep it 100, like, like producers, 
like Definitely. you know studio owners because like that's where people get it twisted is we get stuck in is we need more directors and auteurs and that's great it's great to have as many people like that as possible but the business of film is more than just like directing a picture it's it there's so much into it and a lot of people who you never even know their name are the ones who are really reaping the benefits from the artistic creation that's being put in the world you know so absolutely i mean i'd argue that filmmaking is like the most collaborative form of art that there is like yeah. especially on a commercial level and and uh yeah like the more the more different voices you can have in like every department Mm -hmm. um in the creation of something the stronger it's going to be 100%. um and you know the, the the more engaging and the more it's going to like actually reflect reality is if you have like a lot of voices and a lot of perspectives kind of coming in from it rather than like just one perspective i agree and it's like five like like to think about when you're talking about the most collaborative art form i was i was like it's the only art form of all the <laughs> right that involves all the art forms i like like yeah like, right like acting music photography and videography yeah like writing writing like state like the design like it's literally mm -hmm. everything in one single art form and you need people who are experts in each portion of that to collaborate and make a solidly good piece so yeah no i i think it's highly collaborative which is why it's absurd to not have multiple perspectives and voices on a project because then you're making, you're just making, you're making art in a bubble. It doesn't make sense. So, yeah. uh, you know, so. I mean, even like if you're approaching something YouTube style or like shooting something on your own, like, you know, shooting it over to friends and, and, you know, getting their thoughts on it, getting feedback. Um, there's a lot of ways to approach that writing something with a friend, like collaborating on a script and then going and shooting it. Um, there's like, you know, there's a lot of ways to like involve other people beyond, uh, you know, when it's on a smaller scale, like beyond just like on an industry scale, like how urgently that's needed. So let's shout out some, let's shout out, like we're talking about this and we've been, so, so this is a good, good moment. Like, yes, we do film programming and we're going to do more of it. And DIY filmmaking with Jesse is a great course. I've been in classes, watch because we want more people taking it. Uh, we're going to do some screenwriting courses over at uh, Community Music Space um, as well. So if you want to sign up for a film class or if you want to check out uh, Community Music, uh, DIY filmmaking, maybe they're coming to the end of this session, but maybe would it be okay for somebody to pop in, you think, like just for a class or is it kind of coming to the end? Yeah, they could, they could probably pop in for a class. I mean, especially on like the Saturday sessions where we're kind of coming together and watching footage. Cool. Um, would definitely be doable i mean also just like kind of like you know shooting out a line if you're if anyone is interested in learning you know different aspects of filmmaking like what aspects they're interested in um because you know we're still kind of like shaping up what the next iteration of this is going to look like we're thinking about like focusing on like maybe more music videos and um and yeah kind of like personally directed projects so um just and maybe some, maybe some one-on-one like, -on -one coaching also. Maybe some like one-on-one, -on -one, hey, I'm trying to figure out how to do this thing and I need somebody yeah. to walk me through it. That's also a, a, a tangible idea. Like I need help with like writing a script. I need help with, you know, figuring out how I would scout for a location. What's the process? Like those things really are valuable. So maybe we could explore some options there where if you have questions individually and want to reach out, please message us at communitymusicspace.com. Uh, we have a, a plethora of resources to help um, but I want to take this moment too, besides what we do, as we're talking about inclusion, let's shout out some of the community organizations that we know that also deal with more stock aid works as one I know that you're very linked to. I'm going to shout out Youth yeah. Effects, Youth Effects in Albany. They're, they are, they do amazing work. Um, you talk about inclusion and uh, voices from multiple different perspectives. They're, they're a great example of that and good dear friends of mine. So, um, so yeah, so those are two that I know, but what are some other organizations yeah. that you know locally that kind of like do this stuff? I mean, Artifact in Poughkeepsie has been doing some great stuff in terms of like reaching out with the schools and, and like providing opportunities for students to showcase their work down there um, in Poughkeepsie. And then um, uh, on terms of like a professional scale, um, the the studio in Newburgh. Wow, I'm blanking on the name of the studio in Newburgh. Umbra. Umbra Sound yeah. Stages in, mm -hmm. in, in Newburgh. Like the fact that Newburgh is kind of becoming a hub for um for studio work is like incredible. Um 
you know, in the upstate, in the Hudson Valley in this kind of region, um, cause it, you know, provides a, provides an industry to an, an area that's kind of like been on like uncertain ground in terms of like where the industry is going to be moving and like where the, the work is, is moving to in, uh, in, I in just Uber. have the hesitation speaking about what we were talking about. I just, I just hope that as they, as they do that, like as they're like creating these production hubs in Newburg, a place like Newburg, that they're also, it would be with what Newburg's gone through in the last, I don't know, 20 years, right, of, mm. of existing. I hope that they're involving creatives that grew up in that environment into the process versus coming in from Beacon or that or downstate in New York City and be like, oh, the property's cheap and the whole city's been like kind of like in turmoil for years. Let's buy up some cheap property and then make some production stuff. So I hope that as they're doing that, they're actually including people in that process, like Artifact and those other people. Yeah, I think I think that they've been doing well in terms of like, it's obviously like just starting because a lot of the productions now that are shooting in the Hudson Valley, I mean, there is like Hudson Valley Film Commission too is doing a great job in terms of like connecting producers with local workers so that local crew are working on the productions that are shooting up here. But a lot of them do have a lot of New York City crew. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Stockade Works are crucial to like pushing people to get trained in, you know, how their their skills can be applied for filmmaking. And Umbra, I know, hosts a lot of like free PA training. So it's like free to attend and, and you get, you know, trained as a PA. So as long as their outreach is working okay in Newburgh, I would hope that a lot of Newburgh residents are kind of taking that up and, and finding ways to get involved. I know I've worked with a number of PAs from, from Newburgh and from Poughkeepsie. So it's cool to see, yeah. you know, people that, that grew up in those areas, like working on the films up here. Yeah, a hundred percent. And also, also like looking at top line stuff, right? Like not just, not just like below the line. Stuff, oh yeah. hundred percent. Below the line stuff. Like the below the line stuff, I think they're going to get in spades. People are just going to want to be on sets. I, I mean, that was the biggest realization after film school for me was like, man, I went and got this high price filmmaking degree and now I'm taking out trash and doing errand runs as below the line work. Yeah. Doing the unit, unit PA stuff. Yeah. yeah. Unit PA stuff. <laughs> you know, to get the above the line stuff, you know, here and there, but yeah, I think, mm -hmm. I think, I mean, like, I think what a lot of people realize is the above the line stuff, you really got to make happen yourself, you know? And I think like being able yeah. to, like, like one of my professors said, you're either, you're either a director or you're not. And what he meant by that was not like you're either talented or you're not. He meant that either you're going to go tell your story somehow, some way, by hook or by crook, you're going to write your script. You're going to go and get somebody to help you like raise some money or raise the money yourself. You're going to like figure out how to act, get people casted, edit it all together, or... Yeah you're going to work on a set because there's no clear trajectory as a director from like a PA. Right. So yeah. when they, start you, you have to be like slightly delusional to become a director or producer, like yeah. in the sense that it's just like utter like motivation and confidence to like reach those levels. Um, hundred percent. Like, yeah, you got to really like believe in your work and believe in, in who you are. And like, you know, yeah. Like, like I think like practices in terms of like honing your skill set is going to like, boost that confidence and spending more time on set and seeing how things work like boosts yeah. that as well. So. Cause I was in, cause I was in, I was in New Mexico when they started doing the film incentives. The reason I bring up inclusion and the people who were there and in the beginning, it was just a bunch of people in LA coming from LA doing like a land. Not, I would say land grab. That's an exaggeration. They were hiring the quota that they needed so they could get the tax rebate, but they were really like not telling uniquely New Mexican stories. The, or anything that actually gave voice to the people who were there present already. Right. Just, Just kind of exploiting the region as like a hub. As like a hub. Yeah. And what I found is that what they found actually is when they flipped it and started making Breaking Bad, and right. it actually was a story in Albuquerque, there, it was a big hit. So now you're mm. seeing more things about Albuquerque show up in movies and things like that. Because yeah, right. The fact that this, somebody took a chance. I was like, well, why don't we just make it about a dude who's like in Albuquerque doing these things? And the reason why that works is because there are unique stories. So, so I, when I say the thing about Newburgh, there are some unique stories to experiences in Newburgh that should not be like just like basically we don't want to gentrify through media or through actuality and make sure that we tell those stories. Like I think like that, because there's, there's unique things that happen in these different regions and pockets, like there is in, in Red Hook or there is in, 
in Beacon or there is in, you know, Kingston. So mm-hmm. I think like, I hope as they start, as we start building out our film infrastructure in the Hudson Valley, which is happening, which is dope. Yeah, 100%, I hope we yeah. really get some of the voices like yourself. You know, I, you know, I have stories in me. I know there's other people I know in the region that have stories in them. I know some people up in Albany that do that we get those unique story perspectives into the mainstream, right? To, to get people to see things they've never seen before from a perspective they've never seen. So. Definitely, yeah. It's cool to see, uh, uh, you know, filmmakers that grew up in the Hudson Valley kind of get traction. I hope that that continues, uh, you know, moving forward. Like the fact that we have like, yeah, a good like talent base here and and there is that like New York City connection and stuff and, and there's a lot of productions coming up here. I think moving forward, hopefully we'll see more of those voices start to emerge. 100%. Like yourself, let's give it on the closeout. <laughs> what did you go to Sundance for? What was the film that you guys went oh, to Sundance for and, and your role dude, on that? And- I just and I, and I just realized that I feel bad for calling uh, producers and directors kind of delusional. So I work with a, yeah, a lot oh, of man. producers and directors. <laughs> They're not delusional, I promise. It's just like, you know, it's it's an insane trajectory to get there. But um, uh, yeah, I, I worked on this sci-fi uh, comedy called Save Yourselves last summer that shot in uh, Olive Bridge and I was the location scout and uh, location manager for that project. Um, finding the cabin and woods and uh, lookout and a, bun- a gas station, a bunch of other various spots that they needed to, to shoot the movie. Um, and yeah, got accepted into Sundance, uh, premiered there, uh, which is great. It was like a packed house there, which is good to see. Um, it got a distribution deal, um, which is like, awesome and and kind of increasingly rare at sundance lately so so that was super oh, wait, it, when is it gonna come out do you know or but all this has to kind of slow down i i'm not i think it was supposed to come out this summer but now with theaters closed i'm not sure what the status is it was going to south by southwest um which then got canceled so um you know i'm, I'm not sure where it stands in terms of the uh the the theatrical distribution but i do know it was acquired so it might be it might be ported out to a streaming platform or just have a delayed release uh because of that yeah but yeah no super like one of the best crews i've ever worked with an indie movie with like the heart of gold and like everyone who worked on it was super like into it and friendly and like got along great and i think that really like shows in the finished project so Hopefully, sooner rather than later, people can check it out. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jesse. As always, I mean, we would like I like I always say on on these things we've been doing is we would be having uh, these these conversations regardless. So like, right. my dear friends, <laughs> like, so it's cool. Yeah. It's like stuff that we like to talk about. But man, it's a pleasure to like share this with our community and with people who are tuning in and anyone's gonna watch it in the in the recorded version please go to communitymusicspace.com, sign up for some of the film programming that's there. Jesse is awesome. And we're going to expand that in the coming, you know, weeks and months and and make it available for more people in the online space so that it's not just people who live in the Hudson Valley and we can like reach more, more of you folks. So thank you for joining me, Jesse. I think think also, also for voice lab, I'm going to be doing a little bit of video work in terms of like shooting video for, for people that want to sing and and make music. So check out, the voice lab session that's yeah on. definitely check out voice lab check out all, all the classes there all, all of them, them. All of them. <laughs> yeah check check them out i'll be dropping in on beat lab yeah, yeah. he's always dropping <laughs> love it we love it man he got we like, i was shocked he was because i know you make music but i was like we we're like hey everybody who wants to jump on the track and then it came back and i was like whoa jesse is spitting like he can, <laughs> like this is amazing that's awesome so gotta do it baba black sheep yeah, there it is. Yeah, sweet. No, this was great. Thank you so much, Paul. It was fun chatting. Definitely fun chatting with you, too. All right, Liz. And I got, oh, it's so weird. I can't call my mom Ife, but she's in here, too. Later, <laughs> later Liz. Later, Sarah. You guys, you know, love to all of you guys for joining. And thank you guys for, for being part of it. Um, and, uh, yeah, you guys have a good rest of your day. And um, we'll be back here next week. Enjoy your weekend. Get outside in, you know, a socially distancing manner. And, uh, and breathe in some fresh air as much as you can if you live in an environment where you can. And uh, thank you guys for joining us. Have a good one. Yeah, thanks so much, everyone.